Good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight with Annabel Tiffin. Our top story. Police in Tenerife find human remains in the mountainous area where Lancashire teenager Jay Slater disappeared a month ago. Being a parent, it's devastating news if you lose a child and if, if it's the case, what's happened, it's going to be horrible for her. We'll be live in Jay's hometown. Also tonight, Philip died after a man slashed his throat with a broken bottle. Now his widow wants a ban on glasses in bars and clubs. Just taking those weapons away from these, these people that probably don't know entirely what they're doing and just make it safer. A rose for Safi. The Tutton Flower Show remembers the youngest victim of the Manchester Arena bombing. And wasn't it beautiful this morning? Gorgeous spells of sunshine. But can the same be said for tonight? Well, join me at the end of the programme because I've got some news that perhaps we would like to avoid. See you later. Police on the Spanish island of Tenerife say they found human remains in a mountainous area where the Lancashire teenager Jay Slater went missing a month ago. The 19-year-old holidaymaker from Oseltwistle hasn't been seen since he called friends to say he was lost after a night out. Police said the evidence strongly suggested the body was his. In a moment, we'll be speaking to Andy Gill in Oswald Twistle. But first, let's get the latest from Tenerife uh, with journalist Cleo O'Flynn. Cleo, thank you so much for joining us. This news coming in around lunchtime today. What more do we know? What's the latest there? The Guardia Civil issued a very short, concise press release, as you say, just before lunchtime, Annabelle. And I suppose what are interesting is the keywords they used for me were that this was an ongoing search. It was discreet, meaning it was away from the media spotlight uh, and that it looks like the, the death of the person that they found was the result of a fall or an accident. And they also did indicate very early on in the press release that it could well be the remains of the missing British teenager. So that came out, as you say, just before lunchtime. And uh, as we know, the search has been going on for a month Jay disappeared this day four weeks ago on the 17th of June after a phone call to friends at about 8.50 a.m. And that was the last time, as far as we're aware, that he spoke to anybody. And Cleo, you mentioned a search there. We were told uh, about a week ago that the search had been called off, but that obviously wasn't the case. I know, and it's the first time that I am aware of this happening. Uh, my speculation is that the police and the search teams were both unused to and probably not very happy with the actual level of attention that was being focused on their every move. And we do know that they were also very concerned that groups of volunteers could also get themselves into difficulties. Because if you have any idea of how rough and dangerous this terrain is, as they would know, they would want people to stay away from the search areas. So I think they deliberately said to people that the main search was being called off about two weeks ago that the case remained open. They always said that the case remained open, but they are now telling us that this special mountain search and rescue section of the Guardia Civil continued to search, kept up that search, and they obviously were focusing very much on the zone around which Jay initially was known to have been before he went missing, because the body, if it is that of Jay Slater, was found very, very near to the village of Masca, where we know he was on the morning of Monday, June the 17th. Yeah, and this news will be awful for Jay's family. But as you said, it hasn't yet been confirmed that the remains are that uh, those of Jay. That's correct. We, the body was removed early this afternoon the, by helicopter to be taken for full forensic examination. And we know that the charity LBT, they're called LBT Global, or they're a British-based charity who help families in distress abroad. They have now issued a statement on behalf of Jay's mother and father and family saying that they are waiting for the, you know, the final findings of the forensic uh, examination. They have also been told that some of Jay's possessions would have been found alongside the body as well as clothing. And when they have that final confirmation, they will have the support of the British consulate here, who are an excellent team. And I imagine they will then possibly want to make some statement. But for now, they're asking for privacy. 
Uh, Cleo O'Flynn from Tenerife, thank you very much for that. Well, let's now go to Andy Gill, who is in Jay's hometown of Ossel Twistle. Andy, what has been the reaction there? Well, Annabelle, we're at the West End Methodist Church in Oswald Twistle. They've had services here in support of Jay and his family pretty much since he disappeared 29 days ago. You can see the blue ribbons all along the railings on the church, and not just here. As you drive into the town, there are blue ribbons on just about every lamppost, every bus stop, every street bollard as well. We've been speaking to a man called Paul Fitzpatrick. He's the landlord of a pub just down the road from here called the Hare and Hounds. Knew Jay a little bit, but knew his mum, Debbie Duncan, for many, many years. And Mr Fitzpatrick gave us this reaction to today's news. I didn't know Jay that much, because he only just become old enough to drink anyway. But his mum I've known for probably 20, 25 years. So my heart goes out to her and her family, because being a parent, it's devastating news if you lose your child. And if, if it's the case, what's happened, it's going to be horrible for her. And Andy, the local MP has also been given her reaction to this latest news. Yes, this is Sarah Smith, the new, newly elected Labour MP for Hindburn, which covers Oswald Twistle. Uh, she says it was heartbreaking and people were hoping for better news. But in a statement, Sarah Smith said, My thoughts and prayers are with Jay's family and friends at this time. This is the worst news a parent can ever receive. Just coming back to the West End Methodist Church here, the local vicar here, Matt Smith, has issued a statement saying the church will open tomorrow for people who might want to come and support each other, for the church to offer its support, for the church to continue offering prayers for Jay's family. Uh, so that's the church going to uh, open here tomorrow uh, after this news from Tenerife. And just going back to Mr Fitzpatrick, the landlord of the pub you just heard from, uh, he is planning to hold some kind of challenge charity event, maybe a charity evening, maybe a charity walk. Uh, once the news is confirmed that we think it is Jay's remains who've been found, he wants to organise a charity event to help support and raise money uh, for Jay's family. Andy, thanks very much. Our reporter Andy Gill live there in Ossel Twistle on the latest for the search for Jay Slater. Now, in other news, 12 years ago, Jane Sheriff's life changed in an instant when her husband, Philip, was stabbed with a glass bottle on a night out. After his death, the mum from Lancashire began campaigning for a ban on glasses in late night bars and clubs. She's now joined forces with Matthew Siren, who lost his sight in a glassing attack in December. A warning that you may find the pictures of Matthew's injuries distressing in Katie Barnfield's report. Jane and Philip Sheriff had been together for more than 15 years when he lost his life in an attack lasting just seconds. In 2012, he was at a work party in a London nightclub. On CCTV footage inside, he's seen in the dark jacket. Ashley Charles, in the white shirt, tries to grab his phone and then takes his beer bottle. Out of sight, he smashes it and then drives it into Philip's neck. Ashley Charles was jailed for life with a minimum of 14 years for the attack. After his death, Philip's widow Jane launched the Bottle Stop campaign, trying to ban glass from late-night pubs and clubs. She's now been joined by Matthew Siron, a former rugby player who lost his sight after being glassed in the face by a stranger at a bar in Leeds in December. He needed 40 stitches to his eyes after the attack. Doctors have told him they don't know if he will ever see again. The Home Office estimate there are almost 90,000 violent incidents involving glass in the UK each year. But the head of the Nighttime Industries Association said a ban on glass is not straightforward. We have come up with lots of different technologies from shatter glass to decanting from glass into uh, polycarbonates to selling cans. At the moment where the industry is facing such austerity and such challenges economically, um, it, it's, you know, it's something that's got to be considered, but we need to think about how that phases in. Both Jane and Matthew say they want to make bars and clubs safer to stop anyone else going through the pain they have experienced. Casey Barnfield, BBC Northwest Tonight. Well, Matthew and Jane joined me earlier to talk about their campaign to have glasses and bottles banned from late night clubs and bars. I began by asking Jane, after 12 years, why she was now joining forces with Matthew. 
the drive is different. The drive I had originally was all adrenaline based. Obviously, I was running on on empty, but I was really pushing hard. So the drive is different, and the story is different now. The story is not about me and Phil. It's about all the people that have suffered in the last 12 years, and the changes haven't been made. You know, I was assured that 12 years ago there were enough provisions in place to keep people safe, but clearly there aren't. Matthew, this is relatively new for you, isn't it? You were attacked in December. Mm -hmm. What made you want to sort of start a campaign so soon when you're still recovering, really? Um, I just didn't want anyone to be in this situation and it was soul destroying for me and my family and I just I just believe that something needs to change and I just desperately want it to change and there's no need for me to hold back. Um, I want to help other people and save other people's lives. So, yeah, that was the aim, really. Let's get it going and try and make a change. And it kept me positive. It kept me getting up every day and wanting to do stuff, do you know what I mean? Try and make a change, implement change. How has this attack changed your life? Well, going from doing everything day to day yourself, not worrying about things, um, I've gone into full-time care. It's, it's very hard to take, especially when you do everything yourself. I run my own business, got a family. I look after people, I look after my kids. Now I'm being looked after 24-7. You set up your own campaign 12 years ago after Phil's death. Why do you think you didn't manage to, to get it to take off then? Uh, we got 110,000 uh, signatures on the petition and that was submitted to Downing Street. Unfortunately, 12 years ago, uh, we did it on paper and it turns out that paper isn't valid and they wanted it online. So it didn't get debated in Parliament that time. I did get a reading, a second reading in, in Parliament. I uh, had the Labour Party supporting me. But if I can make sure we've still got that support with the Labour Party, um, I've been in touch with my local Labour MP. Um, hopefully we can get together and get our heads together and, and do it. What would you say to people that don't want this ban? They like drinking out of glass. We're not saying take out of your pubs or anything like that. It's the late night venues that people are highly intoxicated in. Does it really matter? Do you really need glass in a nightclub or a bar? Um, just taking those weapons away from these, these people that probably don't know entirely what they're doing mm -hmm. and just make it safer. It's happening to thousands and thousands of people each year. Mm -hmm. And the messages I've got, it's, soul destroying for myself but also people's families that go through it my family that are going through it there's loads and loads of people that have been injured and it is it needs to change something needs to change that was matthew siren uh, ending that report and we'll keep you up to date on what happens with their campaign now a roundup of some of the day's other news an inquest into the death of a prisoner on the Isle of Man has been reconvened. 46-year-old Christopher Corkill was found unresponsive in his cell in February last year. The inquest heard that his death was the third at the island's jail within two years. A man who threatened the common speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, on social media has received a six-week jail sentence suspended for two years. Mark Innes, who's 56, also sent disturbing images to the Chorley MP after emailing him about the war in Gaza. Wirral Council could sell off one or both of its town halls to save money after declaring, that declaring they were underused. The authority is to consider the options for Birkenhead and Wallasey town halls, which could see them redeveloped for leisure use. A driver was rescued from a car which crashed into a creek in Lancashire as the tide came in. The Coast Guard, fire crews and other emergency services managed to pull the motorist from the submerged vehicle at Thornton Cleveleys. The vehicle was then lifted out of the water. Right, we're going to move on to sport now. Ian's here this evening. The 58, it sounds ridiculous when you say it, the 58-year wait continues, doesn't it? Because it's not coming home. Annabelle, football really isn't coming home. And who knows at this point if it ever will. But what we do know is that players have now come home, as have uh, most of the fans too, which can't have been a fun journey for all concerned, really, can it? Given England's underwhelming ending to a tournament in which they rarely lived up to their world-class potential. But while Spain went into the final as favourites and hope remained in this region and across the country, that it might have been England's year. For the match, both in Berlin and here in the northwest, there was optimism. This was Blackpool. We've got this! We've got it in the bag! It's coming home! It's 
Though we can't say we weren't warned, on Friday this programme sought the views of a clairvoyant. The crystal ball is saying, we're going to think, yes, this is it, we've won. There's just a feeling and just something that's telling me at the end of it, we're going to be a bit sad. You always have hope, but uh, I expect to Spain to win. It's going to them. We do it every tournament. Deflated unbelievably. Yeah, it's brutal, brutal, but on to the next, on to the next. So. Gareth Southgate and his disappointed squad left their hotel this morning to a ripple of applause. Their plane landed at a rainy Stansted airport this afternoon, with the players making their way down the steps shortly afterwards. While at Manchester airport, fans began arriving home after what for some was a sombre night. Um, I went back to the hotel because I needed a rest. I wasn't feeling the party attitude after. But the whole trip was worth it, yeah? Yeah, a really good experience, yeah. The big clean-up at venues like the AO Arena has been and gone, with flags taken down at Downing Street and presumably elsewhere. England came close, just not close enough. But as a wise man said... That's football. That is football, everyone. It's miserable, isn't it? So that's the Euros done and dusted, and it's now less than five weeks until the Premier League returns. And Manchester United have confirmed their first summer signing. Joshua Zerkzy has signed from Bologna in a deal worth £36.54 million, to be exact. The 23-year-old forward was part of the Netherlands squad during the Euros and came on as a sub against England. And Liverpool's Neil Skupski failed to retain his Wimbledon men's doubles title last week, but he has today been named in Britain's Davis Cup team for the upcoming group stage in Manchester. Skupski and the rest of the five-man team will take on Finland, Argentina and Canada at the AO Arena between the 13th and 17th of September. Britain last won the Davis Cup in 2015. Annabelle, that's it on this uh, sombre sporting night, but Hello. our sidekick in Blackpool was right. Well, she wasn't far off. Or I mean, she, she didn't even score as no. such, but... <laughs> or who was going to win, but other than that... No, she, she said she was going to win Spain. Yes, <laughs> true. It ruined my weekend, she was right. <laughs> Ian, thank you very much. <laughs> Now, Lancashire's fire and rescue teams have acquired a new piece of kit which could help save the lives of people who are drowning. It's called the Fusty, a powered buoyancy aid which can get to people in trouble far quicker than a rescuer could swim to them. And this is the time of year when it could be needed the most. Dave Guest has been to see the new kit being tested. Lancashire Fire and Rescue Service are putting their newest recruit through its paces. It's called Fasty and the clue is in the name. This piece of kit provides a fast response when people are in difficulty in the water, far faster than more traditional methods of rescue. We have many methods, but most of our methods require a person to actually physically throw something or swim out to the casualty. Well, they reckon that the fasti could cover 100 metres of water in about 40 seconds, compared to a swimmer who'd take 120 seconds. And in a rescue situation, every second counts. Fasty can be operated remotely and sent directly to the person in trouble. It can easily get there far faster than a swimming rescuer. The person in difficulty is then encouraged to hold on to Fasty and allow themselves to be towed back to safety. But what if the casualty is unable to help themselves? We're going to use the Fasty to go out to the casualty on a tethered line. I'll make contact with the casualty. With that, I'll throw the Fasty to one side when my crew will return the Fasty. I'll maintain contact with the casualty and my crew will pull me in on the tethered line. Pulling a firefighter laden with gear obviously slows Fasty down, but it still provides an advantage for the rescuer. It allows our firefighter to conserve their energy so they can recover the casualty and bring the casualty back to shore. Becky Ramsey is showing a keen interest in Fasty. I've seen this Fasty a few times now and I just think it's absolutely phenomenal. Becky's been campaigning for better water safety ever since the death of her teenage son Dylan. He was just 13 when he died 13 years ago while swimming in a quarry. The reality is we need to understand the dangers and the risks that this water possesses. Um, and it's often things that's underneath the surface that you can't see that will cost you your life. So the clear message is to avoid plunging into uncharted, unattended waters this summer. But for those who do find themselves in difficulties, Fasty might just provide a vital lifeline. Dave Guest, BBC Northwest Tonight. Lancaster. Now this year the RHS Flower Show at Tatton Park is celebrating its 25th year and we're looking back at some of our most memorable gardens there. 
In 2017, we launched a garden to remember the victims of the Manchester Arena bomb. Central to it, though, was a flower named after the attack's youngest victim, Safi Rose Roussos. I've been speaking to her parents, Andrew and Lisa, and began by asking them about the rose. Yeah, the first time I saw it is when I met you and you came up to me with a bunch of sappy roses and it was just overwhelming. It was just, just beautiful. And it was very important for us for her rose to be launched at Tatton Park. And it was because of the love and support that the North West had shown us. Absolutely. You know, it was the right place to launch it. I think the grow it is from the North West. Not far from Manchester. Manchester really supported us in a massive way. Um, and when we had the choice of different places to launch the rose, Tata Park, and, and, and different there. growers as well, yeah. we had choices of growers. Um, and we went with, again, somebody living in the northwest because it hit them um, the most, the worst. They felt it. The rose was, was so important to you both, wasn't it? Just to, Explain how important that rose was. We just wanted something named after her that would live on forever and that we could always have. And watch it grow. It's such a beautiful flower. You know, it, it's like now summertime, we really look forward to it, don't we? It would have been Safi's 16th, and this is a really important time for you, isn't it? Because you want to move on. You want to move on her legacy a bit, don't you? Can you tell us about that a bit, Andrew? We've teamed up with the, the Sun newspaper um, to create an award called Safi Smile Award. And basically, we're, we're sort of looking at um, young people that have gone above and beyond in their lives to do something positive and award them with a with a trip to New York this year, uh, which was Safi's favourite holiday, and she was amazed by the city. We've just come back from there ourselves to celebrate Safi's 16. And it's, I mean, to award it, uh, someone, a young person that's gone above and beyond in, with a Safi award, she will be beaming. I've seen the pictures. So Safi's picture was up on the billboards in Times Square. I mean... Lisa, can you even describe what that was like for you? It was amazing. It was just, it was just out of this world. Um, to actually stand there, and it was, I think it, it's the biggest billboard yes. in Times Square as well. Uh, and then to see a, see a face coming, it, it was just, massive, we it? know that she would, we know that she would be elated. She would absolutely love it. She, she wouldn't have asked for anything better. What an astonishing tribute to Safi there. Uh, right, let's get a look at the weather now. I mean, if, <laughs> I'm getting tired of saying the same thing to you. Where is the summer? Is it going we to appear? We had it this morning, Annabelle. Oh, oh I missed me. it. I blinked and I missed it. <laughs> Do you know what? I'll come to it. But Wednesday, I've been keeping a beady eye on Tatton, oh, yeah. and Wednesday is looking pleasant. <gasps> Fingers and crossed. warm, we might need some cream. So we did have a lovely start to the day, didn't we, this morning? In fact, on the Isle of Man, a gorgeous scene, blue skies. Many of us saw scenes like this. I was lucky enough to spend the morning at Tintersfield Primary School with some of the children for their careers talk, and I snapped the weather picture. It had clouded over a little. Look at their gorgeous faces. Thank you so much for being part of our Weather Watcher pictures. You too can join in. Why don't you follow me on socials? Or, better yet, become a weather watcher. Just need to join in, send me a picture and let me know what it's like where you are in the world. So, it was a fine start to the day this morning, but it did cloud over and we have seen some of those outbreaks of rain. So, unsettled, it's going to be very wet as we head overnight tonight. It will turn a lot drier. And actually, as we get towards the end of the week, with thanks to some high pressure, things will get warmer. Not, of course, for the weekend. More on that in a minute. Here's this area of low pressure. Now, it's spiralling up. It's bringing some heavy, thundery downpours. We do have a warning in force to cater for that. That will clear out the way. We get this weak ridge of high pressure for Wednesday. Things will be calmer. So you can see where the yellow picture is on the map. That's where the warning area is. It's in this area that we're expecting heavy, thundery downpours. The risk really comes in around midnight. So if, bear that in mind if you are travelling overnight. There'll be a lot of surface water and spray on the roads. If you're a light sleeper, you could hear some thunder and lightning from those as well. 
Temperatures, well, warm overnight, 13 to 15 degrees. So it'll be a cloudy start tomorrow morning and it will be damp in places to start. It will brighten up. We're going to hold on to a lot of the clouds, but then into the afternoon, we're looking at this rash of showers feeding through. Now, especially for the hills where they are likely to be heavy and thundery. Further away from those for the Isle of Man, 17 degrees, a lot of dry weather here, 19 degrees elsewhere. Now temperatures then start to pick up. We start to pull up a southwesterly breeze so the air is much warmer. For Wednesday we could potentially get 23 degrees. It stays like that for Thursday and Friday. Then low pressure returns for the weekend where at this stage Saturday morning a lot of heavy rain. It'll be cooler as well. So for Wednesday, a little bit of mist and fog around first thing. That lifts and clears through. And then at this stage anyway, dry and fine, decent spells of sunshine. We can finally say get that sun cream on with highs of 23 degrees. And that's your forecast. Yeah, so you're right. It should be OK for Wednesday. Yeah. A very small chance of the odd isolated shower. Just said it. But... I'm going to get rid of those. It'll be dry and fine. Oh, some cream. Oh, I'm looking forward Lots to that. A bit of warmth. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be featuring uh, the special garden that we did for Diane Oxbury at Tatton. So do join us for that tomorrow. But for now, bye-bye. Take care.